So um, we're to the uh, the main course, which is uh, Dr. Gerald uh, Friedman uh, Jerry. He's uh, economist from UMass uh, Amherst. He's actually chairman of the department. He's, if you want to throw around uh, academic names, he's a Harvard-trained economist. He's also very, very charming, and uh, he's been on the radio twice in the last two days, once on Mark Steiner, and talking about his study, and again today on uh, Dan Rodericks. And he also uh, kind of went to, uh, down to Annapolis with us and uh, jousted a little bit with uh, Peter Hammond. Um, so uh, we're very pleased that he came down uh, to talk to us about his study, and uh, we welcome him. Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Eric. You've been a wonderful host. Um, I've really enjoyed myself. So, you know, as an economist, I should say, um, we're usually unpopular. Um, and coming after him, I can understand. Uh, you know, and the reason we're unpopular goes back to a story told about, uh, well, there are several reasons. One is we have a lousy sense of humor. Um, which you'll understand in a second because I'm going to tell you one of our jokes. Uh, we actually do have three jokes as a profession. Um, and one of them goes back to this guy, George Stigler, Nobel laureate um, and the $20 bill. Supposedly, Stigler was walking down the street with a graduate student. The graduate student saw a $20 bill on the street and said, oh, Professor Stigler, hold up a second. I'll, that's, Stigler waved him off and said, no, don't bother. If it were real, somebody would have picked it up already. <laughs> I didn't say it was funny. I said it was a joke. Uh, you know, economists assume, not all economists, we're different at UMass, but most economists assume that if anything worthwhile could be done, it would have been done already. Because why wouldn't somebody do it? Therefore we live in the best of all possible worlds, and we should all just go home. <laughs> Obviously, the people in this room have not been trained as economists, so you know better. Um, you know, I don't really believe it, you know, but I'm heterodox. Um, I will bend down to pick up money. I've actually done that. I've, I picked up a nickel on the street today. Um, it probably wasn't worth it. But. You know, U.S. healthcare, there's a lot of money lying around. Billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. Of, you know, I'd say 13 billion just in Maryland, uh, 500 billion or so nationally. Um, and it comes from two fundamental problems with our healthcare system. We're going to run through some of the global, the big picture, and then get down to Maryland in particular. But, uh, private health care is increasingly expensive. Um, every year, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts sends me and everybody else um, this statement of how much money the Commonwealth is paying for benefits for me. So I'm supposed to feel grateful. Um, you know, since we now pay 25% of our uh, health insurance premiums, and, um, and they've raised our co-pays and raised our co-pays and raised our co-pays. I'm not all that grateful, but still, um, my family coverage in Massachusetts is, comes to about $25,000 for the family. Ouch. ouch, right, yeah, ouch. Yeah, now, okay, I'm a professor and da 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 da, so that, you know, but you apply that. Um, we have had increases in health spending at a rate for the last 30 years of over 8% a year. That starts to add up. As Edward Dirksen said, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. And the increase is largely due to rising administrative expense, which I call waste. You could call it something worse, because a lot of that administrative expense isn't just pouring money down the drain. It's using the money in a way to make people's lives less uh, worse. Um, and the second problem is we have reducing access. We're spending more and more and more, and we're providing health care to fewer and fewer people. Um, here's Maryland's, uh, this is from the uh, report. Um, this line, the red line, shows the, the index from 1991 equals 100, 
we now are in the area of about 300, we're spending about three, in Maryland, about 350%, three and a half times as much on health care um, as in 1991. Per capita income is over here. It's barely doubled. Not even talking about the inequities and you know, most of the increase has gone to people at the very top, the average person. Todd probably hasn't seen an increase. Um, but even using this average number, this is the excess health care burden. Health care is becoming a larger and larger share of our budget. Now, if we were doing well, it might be okay. This is the United States 2007. I could use 2010 numbers, 2011. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. Oh, sorry. Back then, we were spending $7,000 per person. Now we're spending $8,000 per person. Almost double the second country. We're spending almost twice as much as the average for rich countries. That wouldn't be so bad, except we're getting lousy, cover lousy care. You know, you've all seen things like this. This is health expenditures along here, life expectancy for women. You know, you have to separate women from men, whatever, but the men's the same thing. Uh, 2004, because as I said, nothing, nothing much has changed. I haven't bothered updating this graph from a few years ago. Um, this line is the average relationship between health expenditures and life expectancy. Yeah, you, know, you spend more, you get better results on average, except for the United States. We're out here. Now, if we had the average OECD, this Organization of Economic Cooperation Development, the club of the rich, if we acted like everybody else, we'd have four more years of life expectancy. That would be okay. I'd, I'd take that. On the other hand, if we're only going to have the life expectancy of a country like Portugal, nice country, but poor, then I want $5,000 back. <laughs> you know, I mean, if we're only going to do as well as them, then we should have our money back. The problem is we treat um, health care like good seats at Camden Yards. Yeah, a privilege. Um, Here's Maryland healthcare spending. 44% is in private health, health insurance. Another 14% is out of pocket. If you don't have the money, if you don't have a good job, if you can't afford it, you don't get it. Yeah. The lack of insurance makes us sick. This is why we have lower life expectancies, because so many people who are uninsured even many people who are insured, but especially the uninsured, they don't have a regular source of care, um, or this one, they did not fill a prescription because of cost. Over a third of people who do not have insurance do not fill a prescription. Um, I found out about this because we have a cat who has diabetes. What do you do? 12 years old, euthanize? Yeah, well, so, okay, so we, Got insulin without health insurance. We don't have health insurance for the cat. $140 out of pocket. <laughs> you know, you know the, okay. Plus, we had to buy needles. You know, and okay, you know, we did it because I'm a professor, we have money, da da da. But still, you know, think about if you have a regular, you know. So now what, what do we have here? We have people whose doctor, they went to the doctor, the doctor prescribed the drug and they don't take it because they can't afford it. Obviously, this is not good for their health. Now here we have what economists call longitudinal information, or change over time. Because one thing you get when you show them people graphs like this is, oh, but the United States is different because we're all fat. Um, you, know, you know, we all smoke. Well, actually, we smoke less than we used to, and we smoke less than other people. Oh, we have, we're violent. Well, yeah, we are a little bit violent, but it doesn't, okay. But, you know, before you get into those sorts of explanations, say, okay, look, what has happened over time? Now, here we have France, my favorite country, I admit. Um, my first book was a history of French unions. Um, France in 1971, 
was spending about $200 per capita on health care and their life expectancy of 76. Since then, they've increased their spending on health care and they're living longer, a lot longer. Sweden was spending more than the United States, had higher life expectancy, and since then, Sweden, same country, same, more or less, same eating patterns, cooking patterns, da da da, and they're living longer. Everybody is spending more, we're not the only ones spending more, and everybody's living longer, except look at this. We are the ones who are spending way, way more, and we have had the smallest increase in life expectancy of these countries. We have an incredibly inefficient healthcare system. If we were as efficient as everyone else in terms of extra life for extra spending, we would have another five years of life expectancy. Or, given how much increase in life expectancy we've had, we could have bought that with $4,500 less per person. Using this, you would estimate that about half of, uh, or over half of our expenditures are wasted. We should be able to buy the life expectancy of other affluent countries with a lot less money than we're spending, or we should be able to buy our life expectancy with even less money. Yeah. Yeah. If we spent money as fast as Canada, if we had increased a lot our spending as fast as Canada did, we would be spending $2,600 less per person. You know, you get this sense that, you know, we're somewhere between $2,500 per person of waste and $5,000 per person of waste. I mean, all the ways of looking at it are getting to that. Yeah. And we should have about five years, which gives us a measure. You know, and this is a narrow measure because there's also pain and suffering, the value of lost lives. But just this narrow measure in terms of spending of the cost of our private health insurance system in wasted money. If it's $3,000 per person, then you multiply 300 million and you can do the math, it's a big number. Add in 50,000, 100,000 lost lives, each valued at $3 million, the metric the government uses, you know, you have a really horrible, wasted system. Yeah. Compared to Canada, just to take, you know, our neighbor who's so much like us that we can you know, say, well, yeah. Of the increase in cost, 70% of the extra increase in cost between the United States and Canada is associated with the extra fast growth of administrative expense in the US healthcare system. Yeah. So you take those previous numbers we had we're talking about, multiply them by 70%, which is the waste, you know, approximately the administrative waste, and you've got a really big number. We are spending all that money on administering the healthcare system, the healthcare finance system. What are we getting for it? Next time an insurance company executive you know, goes up against you, ask him, what do we get for all the money we're giving you? Yeah. Not even a positive thing, because it's prescription drugs and the administration of the healthcare system that are driving the cost increases in healthcare. I haven't dwelled much on the prescription drug industry because you kind of all know how horrible that is. Yeah. You know, but you know, when we get to the actual numbers for Maryland, you'll see you know, we should be able to save billions of dollars in Maryland every year um, by driving down the cost of prescription drugs. McKinsey Global, not a heterodox economist group, um, can, you know, kind of Bain Capital type people. You know, McKinsey Global estimates that drug prices in the United States are 60% higher than in other countries in the, in the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. If we were paying drug prices at European or Canadian rates, then we'd be saving billions and billions of dollars. Here's where we've got you know, money. You know, why don't we have single payer? 
because a, a small group of people are making huge profits off of the current system. Um, these five companies, Cigna, United Health, that's at WellPoint, $12 billion in profits uh, in 2009. These five CEOs, $73 million in income left in 2009. $73 million. How many people could get health insurance for that? Well, you can do the math. Yeah. What do they add to the system? Real insurance, like Medicare or Medicare in Canada, pools the risk, which is a good thing. It's a simple exercise for first-year graduate students in, that, in microeconomics to show the benefits of insurance given diminishing marginal utility. If you want, I'll go over it with you. But, yeah. but we don't need to. Real insurance pools resources to absorb risk. So if something really bad happens to you, you're compensated. And otherwise, you chip something in to help everybody else. Private insurance companies make a profit by limiting their risk, the exact opposite of what we want. They limit the risk by restricting access for those who need it. They don't want you if you are likely to be expensive. Adverse selection dominates the profit motive for these companies. You know, it goes back to the 70-10 rule. 70% 70 of your costs in healthcare go to 10% of the people. Most people are healthy, fortunately. That's why you know, we live long. But when you're sick, it can start being really expensive. And they want to find you and get rid of you. Shoe companies profit by selling more shoes. I've got a nice pair of shoes, Clark shoes. I really like that company. Yeah. And they try to be a good company so that I'll buy them and advertise them, and you'll buy them. Health, care, health insurance companies don't work that way. They only want the healthy people. They want to drive away the others. Find the 10% who are sick, drive them out. Lemon dropping, they call it. They probably won't say, call it that in front of you. Yeah. Cherry picking. They want to find you because you're healthy. And they want to get rid of me because I'm unhealthy. You know, lemon drop me, cherry pick you. You know. They, are, they can be nice people. Um, back this summer, I debated James Roosevelt the grandson of the President Roosevelt. I felt really bad about this. But it's okay, he said he supports single payer. He said that at the, he's the head of a health insurance company in Massachusetts, Tufts, I think. And he said that at the national health insurance companies, he filed a resolution to support single payer. He did not get a second. It didn't go to the floor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, he basically argued for the President's uh, um, Affordable Care Act and you know for Romney Care, which is same thing, although our former governor doesn't like to admit it. Um, but you know, the fact is that you can be a nice guy, and you're still going to do it. You're still going to cherry pick and lemon drop, because if you don't, you're going to go bankrupt. Let's say you're a nice guy. You're going to face rising premiums because you have adverse selection. All the sick people go flocking to your health insurance company or your accountable care organization, which is what they're pushing in Massachusetts now, you know, which means that the doctors will become the insurers, not the insurance companies. Yeah, yeah. Um, you will find you've got more expensive people, higher premiums, healthy people, you cherry drop instead of cherry pick. You get rid of the healthy people, they opt out because, hey, this is an expensive plan. I don't want to be in this one. Your pool becomes more expensive. You have higher costs. You raise premiums more. And before you know it, you know where you are? You're dead. You're bankrupt. That's if you're nice. So you don't act nice. And if you do act nice, you're gone. And the company that replaces you is not nice. So we pick and lemon jar. Ah, just having been so depressing, I thought I'd give you this opportunity. I admit it. I mean, healthcare would be a bureaucratic nightmare. Notice what's on the computer screens for all these uh, people working for the health insurance. No, 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 we're not covering that. We don't cover that. We don't cover that. Savings from single payer. This is for Maryland. As I said, $13 billion that we would anticipate for 2013. Um, $3.1 billion would come from reducing the administrative
cost that we now pay for private health insurance. Instead of pri a bunch of private health insurance companies, we would have it all administered by the Maryland Health Care Trust, um, which would operate at the efficiency of Medicare. Um, 4.6 billion larger amounts, this is the largest single component, would be savings in physician and hospital offices. My family doctor, a Columbia grad like me and the president, has one person in his office. She does billing. Yeah. The average physician in Massachusetts in private practice spends $80,000 on billing and insurance related activities. Those would mostly go away. Instead of having um, you know, that billing person, instead of my friend, my doctor, um, you know, spending Friday afternoons talking to the insurance company, instead of that, you'd go in, you'd swipe your card, and that's it. That's the billing and insurance. Um, that would say $4.6 billion. Tomorrow they pass the law, goes into effect January 1st, 2013. We would anticipate about $13 billion, $13 billion, $200 million in savings. But we'd also get the savings that um, Mass General mm -hmm. Hospital, um, which uh, last year I was talking in the legislature in Massachusetts, and I told them, and I, I, I was good, because I said this is an old number, because from the mid-90s, Mass General had 200, something like 250 people in billing and insurance-related activities. Toronto General at the time had two. <laughs> approximately the same number of patients and doctors. Yeah. So I said that yeah, it's an old number. Somebody came up to me afterwards who worked at Mass General. And she said, no, you, you are way off. There are about five, twice as many people now, about 500 people. She didn't know about Toronto General, whether it had gone from two to three, maybe. Yeah. I mean, if they went from two to three, it's because maybe they had to bill in a, a more Americans or something. Yeah, more people from the United States. Okay, so anyway, that's 4.6 billion. 1.2 billion from government administration, which is mostly from savings in the Medicaid program, um, because they wouldn't be checking for income eligibility and all that stuff. They'd just be covering people. A billion from hospitals and durable equipments, market power. Um, this number may be a little high for Maryland because you have hospital rate setting by the, by the state already. Um, on the other hand, I'm assuming a 5% savings here, which is very low for Massachusetts, where there was a report by our Attorney General, the one, yes, the one who lost to Scott Brown. <laughs> but she's actually a very good Attorney General. Anyway, she estimated that for Mass General, that they're charging about double what everybody else does for the same things. Um, so maybe Johns Hopkins does better than that. But okay. Anyway, so that's a billion, and then 3.3 billion from pharmaceuticals. That's the money from driving drug prices down to the world levels. Note, we do not have anything here for the savings that employers would get by not having to deal with health insurance, which is very real. We have nothing here for the savings from reduced stress from people living longer, from a more productive population, nothing from that. You know, this is just kind of the administrative and market power savings. <coughs> 13.2 billion out of 54 billion dollars. What would we do with that? Well, okay, here's lower billing costs, eliminate private insurance, okay. Uh, and presumably, we'd have a healthier population. At a minimum, it would be a less stressful population as you providers and consumers of healthcare know how horrible it is to deal with the insurance companies. Okay, some of the savings will go back into healthcare. Um, I mean, this is a decision you make. You have $13 billion in your pocket. Um, I would suggest, I would assume that some of it would go back into, well, in covering the un uninsured. <coughs> this is a fairly high number because the uninsured tend to be healthier in their study for Vermont, Shaw, and Gruber assumed that uh, uh, the uninsured in Vermont would be 80% as expensive as the uh, rest of the population. I'm assuming 100% here. Um, Medicaid rate adjustment for a billion dollars. Medicaid underpays. And Medicaid recipients have trouble finding providers. If Medicaid is folded into a single payer system, then you, you have to pay 
people the same. So that's going to be a billion dollars. And we're assuming an increase in utilization. 3% for many activities, 20% for vision and dental, because a lot of people don't have that. Um, and we're assuming a doubling in home health care. Um, assuming that that's a really largely unmet need that isn't covered by insurance now. The 3% figure comes from Canada. When Canada went on to Medicare, a universal single payer, there was a 3% bump in utilization, doctor's visits, et cetera. Um, that's in 1971. So that's where we got the 3% figure. Um, the new system would be financed with existing monies, um, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, S-CHIP. We're not giving the federal government a break on these. We're saying, okay, you know, you're going to keep contributing. Actually, we are giving them a break. There's some savings built in there for the federal government for administration of the Medicaid system. Um, there's current state spending on the state's share of Medicaid and you know, some other things. This is n does not include employer-provided health insurance for state <coughs> workers, state or local workers. Um, we're treating the state and localities and the federal government as private employers. Um, so there's $23 billion or so that's already committed uh, after taking count of the savings and after taking count of, um, well, we're leaving 20% of out-of-pocket um, for activities, health-related activities that maybe wouldn't be counted as health by um, our system. Um, six, and if taking count of the $6 billion that we're putting back into the healthcare system, you end up with, you need $23 billion. Um, there are lots of ways to get $23 billion. Um, I'm figuring a 10% payroll tax. The average employer in Maryland pays closer to 11% than 10%. So this is a savings built right in for employers. Small employers would get a much bigger savings because those who provide health care for their health insurance for their workers are paying closer to 20%. You know, small, if any of you are small employees, you know, a couple people, you know how expensive it is to buy coverage uh, for a small group plan. And we have a 12% tax on unearned, what I call unearned income, which is the term from the British tax system, uh, inland revenue. Um, which is income from rents, dividends, profits, um, capital gains, and other sources that are not pensions, not Social Security, um, and are not wages and salaries. Um, that gives us 24.3 billion. There's a billion margin. This is a conservative accounting exercise because the savings. Um, are probably understated. Certainly we're including you know, probably more money here than we need. Um, and we're not counting in here any of the b economic benefits that Maryland would be getting from the system. No, the 10% payroll tax is less than employers are paying now. Maryland employers would get an economic advantage, a market advantage against their competitors in Virginia Delaware, Pennsylvania, and even the great state of Massachusetts. Businesses would come to Maryland because it would be easier to operate a business in Maryland and because it would be cheaper. That would turn into jobs. I would anticipate a 70,000 70, additional jobs after taking account of losses in hospital administration, losses in you know, some of these um, accountants and bill people you know, would lose their jobs. They would, you know, perhaps be retrained and employed doing something useful like being physician's assistants or whatever. Um, but after taking account of that, you'd end up with a net of 70,000 extra jobs, largely because of saving the payroll tax. Those 70,000 jobs will turn into extra tax revenue in their wallet. Yeah. So this is a conservative um, exercise. Most Marylanders would save money, except the losers would be the top 1%, the top four, the next 4%, and many in the next 15%. The bottom 80% of the population 
would save. Currently, health care is largely a fixed bill on households. Your health expenditures, your health needs, whether you're rich or poor, the rich do get a little bit more health care, you know, especially glasses, teeth. You know, there is some optional side to this. But largely, health care is a fixed amount. That means it's a heavy burden on poor people. You know, the bottom 20% who have an average income around 16,000, they are really screwed these days. You know, I mean, even if they're on Medicaid, it doesn't cover all that much stuff. It doesn't cover a lot. Um, so you're taking what is a fixed bill out of people's budgets, and instead you're putting a tax that is proportional to their income. and actually is a little bit progressive. The 10% payroll tax is proportional, you know, 10% of whatever you earn. But the tax on unearned income, which only applies to income above $500 per person in a household, that's borne by the rich. I mean, after all, how do you get to have an income of $2.5 million? I would like to know, and then I'll do it. You know? I mean, I have two kids in college. You know? uh, but you get $2.5 million by having, on average, salaried income of about $500,000 and about $2 million of, of capital gains, interest, dividends, et cetera. Mitt Romney last year earned only, I think it was $350,000 from his speaking fees, et cetera. And all the rest of his $21 million came from dividends, interest, et cetera. You know. So these people up here, yeah, they're going to be paying a lot more. You know, you know they, they're, they're going to get about the same savings from getting rid of their medical expenses that the people down here get, but they're going to be paying a lot more taxes. And that's why their income would take about an 8% hit. How bad is the 8% hit that they're going to be getting? Well, you know, with all due respect, these people's income has gone up like tenfold in the last 40 years. So we're going to pull them down a little bit. But they'll still be earning a lot more than they earned even five years ago. Well, yeah, a lot more than they enjoyed. Okay. Uh, good for patients, good for doctors. Yeah. No bureaucrats standing between patients and the doctors. Wouldn't that be something? Imagine that. It's just you and your doctor, or you and your patients. You just treat the sick. You just do, you, do what you went to medical school to do. And when I go to you, I'll know that you're not doing it because it's what you think is good for my health. Yeah. Continuity of care. The average American changes health insurance between every, every two or three years. That means nowadays, with health insurance piled into networks, it means you're changing your doctor every two or three years. Yeah. Yeah, that's bad. Yeah. Um, everyone in. Yeah. Those people in the homeless shelter, they'll get health care. Yeah. I'll get health care. We'll all get health care. And it would put Maryland on a sustainable path, which goes back to the original you know, issue. If you're just going to be a narrow-minded economist who doesn't care about people's health, doesn't care about you know, whether people live, whatever, you'll still care about this, which is that the projection, with, this is with the president's bill, you go from 16% of Maryland st gross state income to 21% over the next 10 years. Note that you know, on the president's bill, we'll have higher costs than currently, because you're, you know, we will be insuring more people. On the other hand, I'm putting in here, I'm assuming no change in costs. Now, the White House would like to say that the Accountable Care Act or whatever will bring down costs, will bend the cost curve. I would like to think so. I hope so. Um, but the, Congressional Budget Office says no, and the White House never put real numbers on the cost savings because they know that there's nothing really in there that, you know, maybe some things will start to help, but yeah, yeah. Um, so you've got rise in costs, 21%. Under single payer, 
14% now because it's less. Those, that's the money, the $6 billion we're saving. Um, the $7 billion we're saving will rise up to 15% of state income. I mean, it's still going up. Health care is a desirable thing. Every country in the world experiences rising costs in health care relative to income because people want more health care as they get richer. It's something we want. And as we get older, the success of health care makes pe helps people live longer, and you get older, you just spend more. You know. Yeah. I mean, you know, senior citizens spend more than younger people. You know, young middle-aged people spend more than young people. Yeah, you know, like, it just happens as we live longer, as we have a successful health care system, it will cost more. But going from 14 percent to 15 percent, we can manage that. Going from 16 percent to 21 percent, we're already hearing pushback from all from politicians, from everybody that we've got to find a way to economize on health care, and all they have is mess with the doctor-patient relationship. If we go to 21 percent, they're going to be coming into offices you know, saying, don't do this, do this, don't do an MRI, do a CAT scan, don't do a CAT scan, do an X-ray, don't do an X-ray, just feel around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's already what happens. You know, it's going to get a lot worse because They'll be scrambling. If you don't touch administrative costs, and administrative costs continue to rise at 10, 11, 12 percent a year, then you can control health care costs only by reducing care. That will be the alternative. Yeah. Well, okay. There we go. Thank you very much. So we have uh, we have some time for questions. Uh. Dr. Friedman, thank you for coming and sharing your economic uh, viewpoint. I'd like you to expand on a little bit on the idea of the Medicare for All and how it can be used in Once I said that, you know, I went in some place, I said that our health care system was failing. And somebody came up to me and said, you know, it's not failing. It works very well to make profits. <laughs> you know, and that's the purpose of it. It's not designed to provide care. It's not designed to make for a healthy population. It's not designed to um, provide human rights. You know, and the health insurance companies would say, well, human rights is a business of the government. It's not our problem. Well, yeah, let's make it a business of the government and let's make health care a business of the government, too. I just wanted to bring up also the point of bankruptcy, because if we had a single payer health program, nobody's going to go bankrupt because they have a medical illness or an accident. In Massachusetts, um, that actually, after they passed a bill very similar to the ACA, the number of bankruptcies due to medical costs actually went up. The percentage went down because the total number of bankruptcies went up, but the absolute number actually went up. And I think that's an important thing for us to remember. And two, when selling this is that the cost of health care at the individual level is not tied to your illness. Everybody pays into the system, and the system is there for you. So the, no, if the sicker you are, it doesn't mean you have to pay more. And that's really a fundamental point. Yeah, yeah and you pick up the bankruptcy, that's you know, one aspect that we didn't explore, we didn't push very much in this report, um, is the economic efficiency that we would get from a single payer. Bankruptcies don't only hurt the person who goes bankrupt, which is a terrible thing, um, but they hurt the businesses and the banks and the property values the tax, the tax. and taxes. Um, getting a single payer system and removing the employer employment link will allow people to strike out on their own, start small businesses, go get a better job, a job that fits better for them, um, without having to change doctors, without having to risk, um, and it will make the economy work 
the labor market work more efficiently. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Friedman. Um,